Welcome, welcome to the, um, to the fourth of the Gifford Lectures. The lecture this evening will be recorded, it will be available online on the Gifford website, and I now have extreme pleasure handing you over to Professor Kazaniga. This slide uh, I was asked to put up, and if you can read it, you don't have to see your optometrist in the near future. But it's supposed to advertise that uh, the, the, the video version of this, where all of the wanderings and malapropism have been edited out and everything sounds coherent, is available. The first one's available on the website. So tonight's lecture is um, on a topic that everybody in this room has an opinion about and usually freely expresses it. And uh, this is my attempt to try to come to grips with, uh, with the issue of uh, uh, commonly put as, as free will. And I'm trying to change it a little bit and, and, and turn the question around and say, what is the meaning of being free in the 21st century? And so uh, quickly again, our, our, we've come from uh, earlier lectures from the notion that our functionality is automatic, that our modulized Selected brains has a narrative capability created by the left hemisphere interpreter, which in turn gives rise to the illusion of the unity of purpose and leading to the tension that we live in a post hoc world. And tonight we're going to look at the scope of the argument for determinism. Are we just along for the ride is the underlying question. Why none of us believe it? And time to restate the human condition by asking, free from what? What exactly are we, do we mean by this concept? So we're going to try to offer some thoughts on understanding freedom and responsibility in the modern world. And to do that, we will be looking at questions of the level of organization problem, the idea of emergence and emergent minds and downward causation, and basically, how does the mind uh, constrain the brain? So the, let's start with the common definition of free will from philosophy, the belief that human behavior is an expression of personal choice and is not determined by physical forces, fate, uh, or God. In other words, there is a you, a self, a person calling the shots. There is a command center where you're doing the job. You're doing everything. You are making all the moral, and ethical, and routine decisions of functioning in your culture. And your freedom from, you're free from outside causes. You are do, you, 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 the big you, are doing things. And freedom from outside control, you can be free from coercion, compulsion, delusions, and lack of control over one's acts. So it's a very fundamental, profound concept that uh, our culture has, and uh, its origins uh, uh, have been with us for, uh, depending on who you read, for hundreds, of, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. So, uh, so now, though, we are, we're 21st century citizens, and uh, we have a different set of beliefs. We, break, we do believe brains do enable minds and that you is your vastly parallel and distributed brain. I would say most of us are committed roughly to that idea. And there are no ghosts in the system. There's no, there's no funny business going on that, that comes in and energizes this from, from the outside like sort of a, the cartoon of a cloud over the head. And to some extent, when Lord Gifford said, uh, without reference, give these lectures without reference to or reliance upon any supposed special, exceptional, or so-called miraculous revelation, well, he meant in a slightly different contest, the notion that there's something else, some other substance in there controlling the brain uh, uh, it, it is what's at stake. And I think, again, most uh, 20th century views would deny that. So, so the question then really comes down to, what does it mean to be free. What on earth do we even mean by that? Free from what is the way to think about it. What is it you want to be free from when the people continue to talk about this question of free will? And I <clears throat> raise the question that, it, that uh, is the question of free will, a poorly framed question. And so what we're going to do this evening is look at functional everyday freedom, you and me functioning in our society, how it works, appreciating the concepts of emergence I want to get across, grasping the importance of interactions in the social world and what that delivers us on this question, and identifying and understanding uh, downward causation, a tremendously important uh, question in philosophy, and uh, I will take a shot at it. And, uh, and then the, one of the things we will be doing is eliminating the importance of some concepts 
physical determinism and its role in understanding the free will debate, I think, is going to be put to rest uh, and has been by many and uh, continues to be critiqued, and I will do that. And in the end, when we do all of this, we're going to come up with a, a notion that, uh, and, and retain why humans are to be held accountable, accountable something I, I firmly believe in, that all of the science and all of the activities that we're carrying out in no way undermines that key concept. So what scientists and determinists thought they knew uh, and think they know in many quarters is that there's scientific reductionism leading to determinism and therefore questionable responsibility. This is the question that beleaguers many people and they worry about. And I'm going to call this the bleak view of uh, what we're about and, and what we're doing. And uh, why, why is that? Well, people have hold on to this because we believe definitely that there's uh, automatic processes. We believe, uh, we have no problem believing that our cellular systems, uh, the way our genes get expressed and into proteins and function and, and all the rest, we have no belief those go on automatically. Thank goodness we're not under, they're not under any control of ours. But somehow when you start to talk about automatic processes moving up levels uh, and into the brain, uh, people don't like that idea. They simply do not like that idea and do not accept it with the same rapidity that they will accept the notion that there are automatic processes and basic cellular processes. So why? Why don't we, why, why we find it hard to look at this question of automaticity when it comes to neuronal function? And uh, it's because of the major implication. By the time one is consciously aware of something, the brain has already done the work. That is the implication. By the time you have a thought that's already happened in your brain and you're sort of on a little bit of a tape delay, and that's kind of a bothersome thought. And so the, the notion would be then that because of that, we are, are free riders. Our, our mental work, our mental, our, our mental life doesn't, isn't doing any work. It's just going along from one physical state to the next and raises the question, are we sort of not uh, zombies? And uh, of course, uh, saying that and laying it out like that, everybody in the audience probably, I would assume, uh, has the strict re reaction that that's just simply uh, not how I think, how it works. And no one actually believes it. No one believes that we're just sitting around letting life happen. We have this firm commitment to the notion we're involved. And why? Well, we mentioned this in the last uh, <coughs> Thursday's lecture, and that I would tie it again to this important idea of the interpreter. There's something in the brain that tries to figure out the meaning of behavior that uh, continues, uh, that pours out of us emotional states, actual behavior, and we build a theory. So after something happens, this interpreter comes in and adds that action to our personal narrative, and we incorporate that idea, and we believe of course, that it is us that is ultimately doing it. And think about that. Even though that happens after the fact, we can back refer that in time to when we assume uh, the act was being willed. So one can actually do experiments where uh, you take a, a sequence of an event. So let's say we're going to uh, poke a button. And uh, we know that 500 milliseconds before we decide to do that, there's a briar chef potential in the brain building up a readiness potential. And uh, as we get closer, uh, closer and closer to it, there's other activities we could go into and spell out. And then we actually start seeing movement, 41 millisecond in the muscles, that there's a beginning to be a response. And then finally, there's the actual movement down here at uh, zero time. So there's this whole sequence leading up to the actual movement. But uh, Lau at uh, Oxford and now at Columbia University showed that during this uh, 200 milliseconds, actual, actually after the movements, it's over, it's done, it's happened. If you disrupt uh, the brain, in particular areas through uh, uh, this transcranial uh, uh, magnetic stimulation method, that in fact what happens is people, uh, uh, I think he, what's happening there is he's, he's uh, manifestly uh, messing with the interpreter. And so the back referencing in time that occurs uh, just takes that and, and pushes it back in time. And he can show very nicely uh, how that all works. So when we think we've done something after the fact, 
we're just really taking that assumption and pushing it back in time. We're referencing back in our temporal maps of when things are happening and make it and gives us this sensation that we uh, freely willed it before the fact. And you say, well, that's kind of a wild idea, but it's a commonplace idea, actually. Uh, if you look at uh, the simple mechanisms of pain in the body, when you hurt your hand, where your, brain, where your system figures out that your hand has been hurt is up here in your brain, and it refers the pain out here in your hand. So we constantly refer things to spatial locations. We constantly refer things. We constantly refer things to not where the site is, where it, where it happened. So this notion of free will, <coughs> excuse me, this notion of free will uh, is, is obviously uh, th throughout our, our culture, we believe in it, we all think we possess it, and uh, it's obviously reinforced by the fact that seem, systems, societies, everything seems to work better when people believe that that's the way the world works. In a recent clever little experiment by Vos and Schooler, uh, they took uh, undergraduates and prior to, and they were to play a, a, a little game, a little video game. And as they played that game, there was an option to cheat to gain more money if you, if you chose to. So uh, what they did was they take two groups of students. One group of students uh, prior to uh, going into the room to take the test were just given reading material. And it was uh, Francis Crick's book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, which is, has this sort of a deterministic bias to it kind of it's all done before you know it kind of book. And so uh, students would, would re read this and then they'd go in and take the test. And another group of students would read a, a very uplifting, positive book about uh, goodwill and purpose and so forth. And then they would go take the test. And lo and behold, guess what happened? The, the students who read the determinism book, the notion that uh, you're just sitting around for the ride, cheated like crazy during the test and the other ones who read the uh, uplifting book about good purpose in life uh, did not. So this is a concept that not only do we believe it just sensationally at a level of phenomenal self, but it's obviously one that's uh, good for everybody involved so no one really uh, questions it in a serious way. Serious way. But at the level of university life and science and all these things that we do in philosophy, is that just sort of simply happy talk? about free will. I mean, that's fine, you know. But hasn't there been this march in our understanding of the world and how things work, work towards uh, determinism? And sort of the hardliners uh, just sort of, sort of put it to you. They say, just as the world is not flat, humans are not free. Just as the world is not flat, get over it. The world is not free. Get over it. Get, get, get beyond it. That's just the way it is. And, uh, and so there's been this long march towards scientific reductionism over the years. And let me just remind you that uh, so much of it uh, sprang out of Europe. And when you consider Copernicus and deciding that uh, the Earth wasn't the center of the universe and Rene Descartes with his highly biological mechanical rules about the function of the body, got the mind-brain thing wrong, but the actual laws involved in, in the systemic biology, he was, he was right on top of it. Uh, Charles Darwin, of course, with natural selection. All of these things led to a determinism along with Freud and Einstein's uh, uh, theoretical work. All of it point us towards the importance uh, of determinism. And finally along comes in the last hundred years, neuroscience, which has a gazillion studies, again, which point us uh, in that direction. And so there's been an assault on this notion of free will that there is this firm sense of determinism that is building around us. And, uh, and I'd just like to make the side point that while Darwin is the most fabulous biologist that ever lived, and obviously his work today impacts everything that goes on as much as it did the day he discovered it, I would I like to offer and remind everybody of the importance of, of Newton and the importance that grew out of his three laws of determinism and that, that this is the question that keeps pounding on us as we want to believe where we fit uh, in, in the sense of what, what is the nature of our responsibility when we carry out an act. Certainly tight determinism has been pushed by many through the year. If you look at Spinoza, Spinoza said there is no mind absolute or free will, but the mind is determined for willing this or that by a cause which is determined in its turn by another cause, and this one again by another, and so on to infinity, a very strong view 
about the matter, as did Einstein. Einstein said, in human freedom, in the philosophical sense, I am definitely a disbeliever. Everybody acts not only under external compulsion, compulsion but also in accordance with inner necessity. So the, the, uh, the notion of determinism is everywhere. It comes out of chaos theory, the initial conditions uh, uh, problem. We get the butterfly effect, a butterfly moves its wings in China and you have a, an espresso in Rome. Uh, it's, it, people, people hold on to this and you know this little poem, for want of a nail in the shoe is lost, for want of a shoe the horse is lost, for want of a horse the rider is lost, for want of a rider the battle is lost, for want of a battle the kingdom is lost, and all for the loss of a, horse shell, a horseshoe nail. So uh, this looks random, but it is highly determined, and this is a dominant view, uh, as I said, in the scientific uh, community. So uh, you, let's think about that. Okay, let's take their view, let, let's run by, and let's see uh, uh, just a quick look at neuroscience. It, it basically is supportive of some understanding of determinism. And let me come at it by asking the question, and generally, what is the brain for? Now this is a question that you would think most neuroscientists could answer like that. But in fact, it's, it's not. They, they, they don't think about it that much. But what it is, is uh, they think about it, the subparts. But it, what is the brain for is the, the underlying question is, it's a decision making device. It's there to make decisions. And so it has to gather information from all kinds of sources in order to make a proper decision from moment to moment, second to second. It is a decision-making device. And uh, if you just think about it, here's a, a skeletal view of, of uh, the human body, and we can do an experiment. Stick out your hand, touch the tip of your nose, and you will have the sensation that, in fact, your nose and the tip of your finger were touched at the same time. But in fact, the neuron that identifies that you were touched at the tip of your finger is about three and a half feet long, and your nose neuron to the processes that go on to make this comparison are two or three inches long. And yet there's this sense of simultaneity. So the information is gathered, 250, 500 milliseconds, people argue about this, computed, a decision is made, and you get the sensation of uh, conscious experience. That's conscious experience, and it comes together uh, after the information has been gathered. So, so you can see evidence of this uh, all over. Uh, I'll give you an example from our own research. Just put, let me put those up. Oop. So you ask a person, uh, look at a, play, a, a fixate a point, and you flash the stimulus in the right visual field, which goes to their left hemisphere. And if you look at uh, uh, intact people, which is to say everybody in this room with their corpus callosum, you see that there's immediate activation of the visual cortex in the left hemisphere, and through time, this is 100 milliseconds after the flash, 124 and then 148, through time, you see the information spread over to the other hemisphere. And then you do the same test on the split brain patients that we've been talking about all last week. Do the same test, you see the activation in the left hemisphere, but because the brain has been divided, the activation remains localized in the, in, the, uh, in the left hemisphere. So therefore we can identify the actual pathways involved in gathering the information. These, take, these things take time and through time, gathering the information for decision making. And, and this is a, a reference to the famous work of uh, Benjamin Libet, who uh, 20, 25, 30 years ago now, working at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, demonstrated that uh, when in, during the course of, uh, of uh, uh, neurosurgical procedures where the patient was awake, he could stimulate the actual cortical surface that represents sensation from the hand, and it wasn't until 500 milliseconds later that the patient had the, felt the sensation. There was a processing time. There's time to consciousness is the idea. So Sir Charles Sherrington, uh, made an interesting observation that takes us into other modern imaging ways to look at this question. Sir Charles Sherrington said, in looking for mind and energy, we are not looking for a form of energy then to translate it into mind. What we look for is an energy which is mind. Now, that is a, that is a very complex uh, 
set of concepts there. And uh, for the moment, I'm going to read it as that we can say that, that the new imaging techniques are doing the latter. They are, in fact, indicating that uh, the energy that is being recorded in these new brain scans is the mental processes that uh, we are experiencing. And William James, uh, in 1890, said, we must suppose a very delicate adjustment whereby the circulation follows the needs of cerebral activity. Blood very likely may rush to each region of the cortex according as it's most active, but of this we know nothing. So over a hundred years ago, William James, who said everything correctly, from what I can figure out, uh, predicted that there might be a way to capture blood flow to be an indicant of mental processes in the human brain. And of course, as we all know, because of the vast importance of, uh, obviously, the blood supply to the human, uh, the human cerebral cortex and to mental processes, we're now able to do this through using magnetic resonance imaging, where we're actually tracking the oxygen level of blood to figure out what the nervous system is doing, which is to be a reflection, of course, of what mental processes are. So using these processes, as we've demonstrated before, we now no longer look at a, the brain as we did 40 years ago as a static system, but we can look at it and see it as this dynamic, ever-changing system that is constantly in motion and in action through these uh, blood uh, measures. And using uh, bl blood control, bl blood flow measures, excuse me. And using these, these techniques, uh, very ingenious experiments are done. This is work by uh, 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 John Dylan Haynes and, and his group at, at Oxford, where they're basically looking at uh, the mechanisms that are involved in, the, uh, in making a particular choice, and they can find the antecedents they maintain up to 10 seconds before an act is made. By looking at the MRI and seeing the pattern of results, they can make a prediction of high accuracy what the person is going to do. So the notion is it's all in there, it's all happening, and when you think you're uh, willing it uh, uniquely at the end, that's just an illusion. Actually, the brain's taking care of the whole deal for you. And, uh, and there's another, uh, just last year, another article by Chris Frith and his colleagues uh, that uh, it's got the attention of The Guardian and, uh, and where they were very extremely concerned about the fact that people can read people's intentions. And of course, as you think about this, this is a very uh, 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 fascinating topic and will be brought up in my last lecture as to how this will apply in the legal system and to uh, the judicial process. So, so here's the... Here, when you add all that up together, here's what you get. You get the causal chain claim, as I call it. Uh, the brain enables the mind, and the brain is a physical entity. The physical world is determined, so our brains must also be determined. If our brains are determined, and if the brain is the necessary and sufficient organ that enables the mind, then we are left with the belief that our thoughts that arise from our mind are also determined. Thus, since free will is an illusion, we must revise our concept of what it means to be personally responsible for our actions. There's the, there's the hard view. And put differently, the concept of free will has no meaning. It just was an idea that came up. No one knew all this other stuff about the way we work. Why don't we get rid of it? So that leads us to this, this refrain. Free from what? When you think about it, what do we want to be free from? We don't want to be free from our experience of life. We don't want to be free from our temperament. We don't want to be free from this or that. The other thing, what is it we want to be free from? So uh, this uh, topic, of course, draws everybody's attention. And I wanted to mention uh, two people, uh, again, uh, Sir John Eccles and, um, and, and, and Donald Mackay. And uh, this last picture here is a, a placeholder for me in that uh, I'm trying to get in, get up, get up on the top of the mountain with these guys, so uh, I, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to make it. Uh, anyway, uh, so and I'm going to I'm going to talk about the, the system uh, a bit differently from this socially emergent downward causation point. So first, uh, Sir John Eck Eccles uh, had this uh, idea and model, and uh, Deus ex machina, I say. All of a sudden, he has a, a, a complex model built on physiology, his life work, brilliant work in neurophysiology. And, uh, and then at the end, he felt that somehow mental processes landed 
uh, on the supplementary motor uh, areas of the left hemisphere, and uh, the brain just uh, hopped to these set of commands, and that's how the mind-brain problem was explained. Don Mackay, uh, I think, was almost on the money. I think he almost spelled it out, and, 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 for, and, and I, I, I wish he was, was with us so that, that we could have this discussion. Don Mackay pointed out that he, he recognized that the brain is a mechanical, it's clockwork, as he put it. The subjective eye is embodied in the brain. We can control what we can evaluate. We do not control our brains, we control our behavior. And the only problem I have is this we that he keeps coming back to. What is that? How would he define it as, as opposed to uh, 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 myself and others? But, uh, but uh, in, in doing so, uh, we have to look very carefully at how one in neuroscience would try to go after and define and understand what, would be, what a brain, a neuroscience, a brain science claim would be on this issue of determinism. How does it work? So uh, this, this allows me to explain somebody's work that I think raises a profound problem for neuroscience and why we are led ultimately to the need to, for the concept of emergence. And its, and its underlying issue is determining the correct level of, of analysis. And uh, it, it, it is the first time I've seen in neuroscience where the notion of multiple realizability, which is a clear philosophical concept, but there's many ways to have the same output. Uh, it's really been worked out to be true in a simple animal uh, 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 by Eve Martyr. And uh, what she does is work on how the gut of a lobster requires eating a lot of lobster. The gut of a lobster contracts through its very simple nervous system. And in fact, uh, what she does is she's literally isolated the entire network, knows every Elect, uh, knows every synapse and it knows the entire innervation pattern. But this is, uh, you can't see it, but this is the anatomy that shows the uh, various innervations of the muscles involved. And uh, begins to uh, take, knows every node and then builds a model of it. And uh, through brute force analysis shows that there's literally millions of combinations, millions of combinations of firing and an action at the level of uh, neurotransmitter expression and so forth, that this simple little nervous system could be in to produce the contracted state. And even though there are millions, she also determines that there's between 100 to 200,000 settings of those synapses that would produce the exact same behavior, the exact same phenotypic, as it were, expression, the exact same contraction. So that that makes it look like, uh, gee, how are you going to ever be able to capture through your single unit uh, and, and very molecular approaches, how you're going to be able to capture what is actually going on to produce the behavior. And so there's enormous diversity at the local level, is one way of putting it, leading to a common behavioral phenotype. That is, that is, that is a profound problem that all of neuroscience uh, has to think about how they're going to approach and what level they're going to approach trying to figure out what the deterministic rules are for understanding the nervous system uh, in this deterministic way. And another problem I just wanted to throw out is that uh, uh, neuroscientists have uh, tried for years to understand maybe the brain code by understanding how information from one point gets to another and very simply by sticking an electrode uh, between the two. Uh, there's a problem with this as, as uh, outlined by the very simple fact that uh, how information gets shuttled around the, the uh, internet. When you send out a piece of information and you want it to go from point A to point B, as most of you know, the information is divided up and sent down three different pathways and it finally winds up with a proper, properly addressed at the end. It gets reassembled. The internet was built that way on purpose. And so if you're putting your electrode down one of these links, and you're trying to figure out how the information gets from A to B, you're gonna have a tough time because you're not seeing all the information that's involved in the expression uh, at the end. So I just wanted to point out that the neuroscientists have their work cut out for them to capture how this is going to, uh, how, how this is going to support and build a theory 
for underlying determinism of an act. So, um, so this leads to the, the uh, uh, wonderful cartoon by Robert Laughlin. Simple determinism is preposterous. Here, here's a little boy on a merry-go-round. Here's two guys walking along, talking about how free they are. And he's about to get conked uh, with that yo-yo, and life is going to be a different thing. And to say that you could understand that in a deterministic framework uh, is uh, laughable. So, uh, from, so we go then from primitive determinism to emergence, this, this interesting concept. And determinism has supplanted dualism in the brain sciences, there's no question about it, yet falls short of explaining behavior and our sense of personal responsibility and freedom. Determinism in the physical sciences has been challenged by the principle of emergence. Now, emergence is a common phenomenon that is accepted in physics and biology and chemistry, uh, but it has very, been very resisted in neuroscience, and I'll come to that. But the notion that uh, the not so fast with the determinism, of course, started years ago with the, challenge, the classical challenge by, uh, uh, by quantum mechanics, and uh, as set forth here in two Gifford lectures by Niels Bohr and, and Werner uh, Heisenberg, uh, Bohr says the renunciation of the idea of causality in atomic physics has been forced upon us. And, uh, and Heisenberg said, I believe that indeterminism, that is, is necessary and not just consistently possible. So way back, kind of starting the, the groundwork for this notion is that this whole notion of determinism can't, can't capture it because of these uh, quantum mechanical problems. And uh, Richard Feynman, the great physicist, said, yes, physics has given up. We do not know. We do not know to predict what would happen in a given circumstance, and we believe now that it is impossible that the only thing that can be predicted is the probability of different events. It must be recognized that this is a retrenchment of our earlier ideal of understanding nature. It may be a backward step. That is impossible to beat the puzzle, that this is the way nature really is. So there's this, this idea that uh, something's happening here that we can't capture in this bottom-up approach. Uh, here is a, a wonderful uh, a seminal paper by Philip Anderson in 1972, really kicked this off and people began to see the importance of emergence on this question. He writes, the main fallacy in this kind of thinking is that the reductionist hypothesis does not by any means imply a constructionist one. The ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. In fact, the more the elementary particle physicists tell us about the nature of the fundamental laws, the laws relevance they seem to have to the very real problems of the rest of science, much less to those of society. So Anderson is saying, you just simply can't get there by studying the, the micro story. You can't get to the macro story, even though it's a macro story and people commonly use here from biology the example of the anthill. You could study the ants till you're blue in the face and you wouldn't be able to predict that they wind up produ producing uh, such things. So, so Robert Laughlin, the Nobel laureate, and wrote a wonderful book on this topic, uh, summarizes it very briefly. We are seeing, it, what we're seeing is a transformation of worldview in which the objective of understanding nature by breaking it down into ever smaller parts is supplanted by the objective of understanding how nature organizes uh, itself. So uh, if we take stock here, here's, what, here's how I see it. Uh, there's a complete theoretical understanding of the microscopic constituents does not suggest a new set of general theories for how they get put together into interesting macromolecular structures. That nature does it is in no way in question, but whether we can theorize, predict, understand this process is to Feynman highly improbable, and Anderson and Laughlin believe it is impossible. So that, that is a, a, a pretty profound uh, set of uh, claims, that the simple upwardly causal constructionist view that understanding the nervous system will allow us to understand all the rest of it is not the way uh, to think about the problem. And then the question is, what do we do for a living?
who are these killjoys? You know, we've been maintaining that, <laughs> you're not laughing, we've been maintaining that we are going to nail this, uh, and how do, you, how do you think about this? Well, broken symmetry is everywhere. The idea of symmetry breaking is simple. Matter collectively and spontaneously acquires a property or preference not present in the underlying rules themselves. That's what we're talking about. That's what emergence is. And as I said, it's an easy concept in physics, biology, chemistry, sociology, but it's resisted in neuroscience. And the question is why? And the reason is because if you bring it into neuroscience, there's an implication, there's a, there is a ghost in the machine. There's something in there doing the work and it isn't the brain. It's not the intention, it's not the right way to think about it, but I think that's, that's why there, there's resisted. And we know emergence, as I said, is all over physics. Newton's laws are basically emergent since you can't predict uh, the Newtonian phenomenon by looking at the uh, quantum mechanics. So um, here's my, one way I think about this, and that is um, it, 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 to, to use the metaphor of uh, when we come to think about how the brain may uh, be involved in the process of uh, of, of, of choosing and of responsibility and, and this, this whole notion. Think of it this way, cars are automatic. What's this, give me that, cars are automatic. Now, analysis of tra traffic cannot be achieved by studying cars in isolation. A new set of laws emerge from cars in group motion, it's called traffic. And I have a wonderful demonstration of this, that uh, there's no way by understanding cars you're gonna understand uh, traffic. And it, what it gets at is that how we're going to think it is that people, I mean, excuse me, brains are not free. No one's, brains are not free. They're this determined machine. It's people that are free. People are, is more than one person. People are two and more. Rules start to develop. Things start to happen. And that's where you're going to capture where uh, the notion of freedom is. So first of all, the, the car metaphor to show you that in fact, a determined system can function at the level of traffic that you would never predict by knowing. Back by a popular demand, here's some more traffic footage. The last footage I showed, it was actually in Hanoi. Now I'm in uh, Da Nang, which is about halfway down. There you go. Oh, six. So now you think about it in terms of brains. Brains are automatic, is the claim. Analysis of brains cannot illuminate the capacity or responsibility, a dimension of life that comes from social exchange establishing rules. It's people getting together and agreeing upon things and the freedom is in that interaction. It's not to be found in your brain. And the whole way of thinking about it to me is an error. And if you just take a look at this wonderful uh, barn raising in Amish country, you see that the, it's the social organization involved in all those independent souls there that allow for that event to occur. You don't think about it in terms of one particular person. It's the interaction. And uh, I just, for uh, uh, relief, uh, show you an incredible thing. If you've ever seen one of these barn raisings, uh, it's the social organization that produces it. It's not the, the individual. They can put one of these things up in a day. All right, well, you get the idea. So. It's people, it's the people interactions is where freedom and responsibility are discovered. It's not simply uh, in the brain. It's very important. It's the interactions of people that, that is where the problem is to be found, I think, to a large extent, and, and where it is to be understood. So uh, I want to now explore one last uh, thing this evening about uh, middle states and and how they can constrain the brain. This may be another dimension to the problem. And uh, let's see where we go with this. Uh, so what we have said is human behavior is an expression of personal choice and is not determined by physical facing. We can take that one off the table by uh, modern standards. And then we have human behavior is the product of a probabilistically determined system which is guided by experience. Well, that's certainly true. Uh, and, but the two, that, I, that I'm arguing for in the pre freedom and responsibility question is the phenomena that come out of group interactions when people are involved as opposed to one person and the mental state selected by the general milieu, milieu constrains the brain. 
A mental state constrains the brain. Now, how can that be? What does that mean, even? So, in figure, trying to think this through, I've been enormously uh, helped and aided by David Krakauer, I want to give full credit to here, who's a theoretical biologist at the Santa Fe Institute in, in uh, New Mexico. And as it, it's put, it's getting from micro B to macro A is the problem. How do you get from the subunits up to the thing that's, that's bigger? How do you have a coherent story there? And there's about two or three slides here, but I wanna, I'm gonna read it along because I want it to, to uh, be completely clear on, uh, on how to think about this. So the trick for any level of analysis is to find the effective variable that contains all the information from below required to generate all the behavior of interest above. This is as much an art as a science. Now bottom-up causality going from a B micro level, neurons, to an A macro level of thought can be both intractable and incomprehensible. Top-down causality refers to the description of A causing B when A is expressed in higher level effective variables and dynamics, and B in terms of the microscopic dynamics. Physically, all the interactions are microscopic, B to B, but not all the micro microscopic degrees of freedom matter. So that's a formal way of saying how B can generate A, but A is still part and made up of B. So uh, he gives examples in computer programming. We interface with complex physical system that performs computational work. That's what we do when we're typing in our computer. We do not program at the level of electrons B, but at the level of a higher effective theory A, let's say we're using list programming, that is then compiled down without loss of information into the microscopic physics. Thus you can say A causes B. Of course, A is physically made from B, and all the steps of the compilation are just B with B physics, but from our perspective, we can view some collective B behavior in terms of A processes. So it's a very nice way, to me, of stating the problem. And in the level of a brain program, he puts it this way. In brain science, we use concepts like anger, tone, and perspective. These are the A coarse grain variables standing in for B microstates. We work well with the A level due to limitations of our own introspective awareness. Internally, something beyond consciousness does the compiling. So maybe either A or the compiler can be thought of as a language of thought. We are not separate from the machine, but understand ourselves at suitable A levels. Now here's the really crucial part to me. The deeper point is that without these higher levels, there would be no possibility of communication as we would have to specify every particle we wish to move in the utterance rather than have the mind compiler do the work. So why do things, there's an absolute necessity for this emergence to occur to, in order to control this teeming, seething system that's going on uh, at another level. So overall then the idea here is that uh, we have a, uh, a, a variety of emergent uh, processes going on from particle physics to atomic physics to chemistry to biochemistry to cell biology to physiology up to the mental, producing the mental. And those are all emergent systems all the way, the way up. And then once the mental states exist, is there anything like a downward causation that, that somehow having a mental thought, a mental, a, a mental moment, come, somehow constrains the brain that produces it? That's the $64 uh, dollar question in this business. And uh, I think uh, what I want to try to do is offer a thought on this that, uh, that it might help us think about it. Uh, the classic way and puzzle is that there's, uh, it goes like this. There's a physical state, and that physical state produces a mental state. Okay, and then uh, at a second time, T2, there is a, another mental state produced, assumingly, uh, we assume, by a physical state, P2. It goes from P2 to M2. Very simple, very straightforward. The question is, how do you get from M to M2? This is the question that puzzles everybody. And uh, 
If you just go from P to P2, then we are truly along for the ride and there's, there seems to be uh, a great tension with that notion. And, and no one is suggesting that you go from uh, mental state to one to mental state two without going through the brain. So that one's sort of tossed out. But the remaining puzzle is, is there a way of getting from mental state one through some more downward constraining process to be uh, guiding to physical state two? That's the question. And uh, <laughs> the slowly rising question mark uh, means that it is a tough question. And, uh, and uh, one, uh, uh, everybody in this room uh, should have ideas about it and think about it hard because it is, it is, a, it is a profound problem. So let me offer you a way of thinking about it. And uh, it has to do, uh, again, my, my gratitude to David Krakauer for uh, helping uh, think on these issues. Uh, we used to think a gene was a very uh, simple um, sort of system, beads on a string and a chromosome, and when they express themselves, they built something, and let's say it's a tree uh, in this example. And then uh, we now know, of course, that uh, the genes aren't that simple, that there's a, a multiplicity of events going on. You might say a gene is a computational moment when all kinds of things are going on, so a variety of genes, transcriptions, microRNAs, it's a very complex thing now. But still, it produces something, and let's call it the tree. And then the, the next tree uh, is produced from a, another a seedling. And uh, if you just uh, look at, well, maybe that next tree will be identical or not, and maybe that'll just be a possible mutation, and we all know about that, and, and that's simple. But what about the fact that this uh, tree uh, might in some way affect that, that next genome? What if you think of it as uh, many trees in an environment and wondering whether somehow one of them has a downwardly causal effect on the next seedling. Well, it turns out when the big tree grows, it's, it's, it's casting shade and other uh, issues, taking resources out of the soil. And so the next trees that grow along are going to be affected by that. And uh, they're going to have a different composition and they're going to be passing on a different uh, history to the, to the subsequent tree. And so you see that all of a sudden there is an a, a, a epigenetic environmental milieu impact on which tree actually progresses to the second uh, uh, tree. So um, let's take this into the brain model. So you, we know from our uh, last week's lecture that we shouldn't think of P1 leaving to M1, but there's P1, P2, Pn. There's all kinds of multiple processes going on simultaneously generating whatever it does. And uh, they produce uh, mental states, and we're going to call those M, and there's a bunch of them. There's a cloud. There's a constellation of them in our mind at all times. And uh, as we uh, and each of those will go for the fun of it, or, or not fun of it, the point of it is that the, those mental states are probably uh, reflecting emergence. And so they are occurring in a complex environment in the world we live in. And the question is, what happens when we get to time two now? What happens when we get from P1 to P2 to Pn? How can we think about how the mental states in the first condition constrain the uh, system such that uh, there's an influence on uh, P2 and the variety of mental states that, that come out. So what, how you think about it is that uh, one of those mental states will grab our attention. One of those mental states will dominate for reasons that we don't quite understand, but they're certainly under the influence of our experience, of the environment, selecting things, of uh, it's the moment when everything that around us in our culture and our world influence which mental state, which then means it's going to constrain uh, the next row through time of what mental states may follow from that. And so uh, I'll give you a, an example of uh, kind of a, a startling example of how a mental state uh, certainly defines how one responds to a upwardly causal system coming uh, in a brain science setting. And these are patients that are operated on uh, during the course of, uh, 
of uh, various tumor surgeries. And uh, the, this work carried out uh, by Dr. Mark Rayport in Ohio, he would put an electrode in a conscious, pa patients are awake during a lot of neurosurgical procedures, and he would uh, put a electrode in the olfactory bulb. For those of you out there who know anatomy, this is the only figure I could find. That's not the olfactory bulb, so forgive me that. Uh, but he would simulate, he would put an electrode in the olfactory bulb, and then he would, and the patient didn't know any of this and, and was completely unaware of this whole part of it. Uh, and the, the physician would say, uh, uh, th tell us about uh, something uh, pleasant. Or think about something pleasant. He says, oh, you know, uh, Oh yeah, it's a wonderful afternoon, I'm sitting on the front porch. And then unbeknownst to the patient, the doctor would stimulate, and all of a sudden he'd interrupt uh, after the stimulation and say, who brought the rose into the room? Oh, well, it's a wonderful smell, okay? The doctor leaves the electrode in the same place, same stimulation parameters, all that kind of stuff, and a little while later uh, changes the mental set of the patients and says, you know, think of something uh, terrible or think of something that's upsetting to you. And the patient says, oh, well, you know, and goes off on some story about some tension at work or something. And then again, the stimulus is turned on unbeknownst to the patient. And all of a sudden the patient says, who brought that rotten, rotten egg into the room? What, what is that? It's terrible. Get that smell out of here, you know. So my head's open. <laughs> so, uh, so by changing the mental state, of the patient, the same exact physical state underneath of it is given a different uh, interpretation. So here we have this constellation of mental states bobbing around in us at all time, being driven by these multiple brain systems. Here we have all these bottom-up influences occurring. And for some reason, at some point, one of the mental states is dominating and when a bottom-up influence comes, the response is made consistent with the mental states that happens to be dominating at that moment. How that domination occurs, as I've said time and time again, I don't think we under, truly understand, but it's certainly influenced by all the things we do, by the practice that we engage in, by the thoughts that we carry, by the things that come from that priming of those kinds of ideas, and so forth. So I broached a, and my final uh, thought here is I approached uh, really one of the world's leading uh, neuroscientists, good friend, uh, uh, Bill Newsom, William T. Newsom, and uh, I asked him, uh, I, you know, what do you think about this emergent properties? How are emergent properties studies? And Bill said, I believe in emergence and ultimately in the idea of downward causation. My question is, where does one stick the electrode to study it with scientific rigor? rigor? And uh, he's got a point. Uh, how on earth do you capture that? But he went on to say that uh, I don't think that downward causation is likely to be studyable with single electrodes. Downward causation will have the form of a higher state of the nervous system governing the action of single units. The goal will be to discern the underlying unitary state of the system via the many noisy looks we get by the, electro the, by the individual electrode. So he's really saying that the, 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 the single electrode approach is, going to, approach is going to continue to define the underlying landscape, but there's really a new science to be done. There are going to have to be new techniques developed to capture these higher states, and those will be the things to be understood in trying to find out the uh, forces that go in to our cognitive and uh, phenomenal awareness. So to sum up, Here's how I would argue. A setting of course of action is automatic, deterministic, modularized, and driven not by one physical system at any one time, but by hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions. The course of action take, taken appears to us as a matter of choice, but in fact is the result of a particular emergent mental state being selected by surrounding milieu, resulting in a course of action. That is how the machine, that's how the brain works. Thus, downward causation is the match between ever-present multiple mental states and the impinging contextual forces within which it functions. Our interpreter then claims we freely made a choice. Now, it gets more complicated. 
because we're going to now have to consider the importance of the social context within which we live and how the social constraints on all this system that I've defined in terms of uh, uh, an individual psychological entity also plays uh, into uh, this game. And uh, that will be the subject of uh, tomorrow night's, night's lecture. And as you can, of course, tell, we're all under constraints, even uh, fish, that uh, somehow there's something going on at the group level that constrains how and where they swim. Thank you. Am I first? I guess I'm first. Mike? No, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you gave a lot of examples of uh, why we should uh, think that there are epistemic problems with reductionism. Uh, but nothing that you said so far has uh, undermined the metaphysical issue of determinism, it seems. So what, what you've pointed out, pointed out is that there are epistemic limits, but if I were a hard determinist, I could still say, you know, emergence, emergence, it's all the same. Everything's determined and everything happens because of causal laws, right? So mm -hmm. does anything that, that you say contradict the metaphysical problem of determinism? In, uh, no, no, I don't think so. But what it does say in the question of, uh, a personal responsibility is that where do you look for it? You don't look for it in the brain. You look at it in the interaction of groups. And so this becomes highly important in, when you're considering certain legal questions, I think, that uh, you, you have to know where to find responsibility. You're not going to find, uh, dimin you're not going to find evidence for diminished responsibility, particularly uh, in, the, in the brain. People want the responsibility center. Is that lesion? Is there a problem with it? No, that's not, where the, that's not where the game's being played. The game is being played in the interaction of people. And I, and I suppose that, that is the uh, approach. But your, 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 your point, the emergent schmergence, um, hmm. it, it only has bite if you are a hard determinist. Yeah, well, right. What do you think about that? I don't know if I can squirm out of that one or not. I think. Yeah. Good question. Thanks. Thanks very much. I found uh, today's lecture very stimulating, um, but thinking um, as it, of it as a, a continuation of the previous stuff, I still haven't heard anything that convinces me that the narratives constructed by the interpreter are, as you were saying today and as you were hinting last time, an illusion. You said the last time that um, the interpreter is only as good as the information it gets, and you gave us examples of cases where it doesn't get the, the information for various reasons. But what if it does get the information? Um, if it's sometimes constructing a rationalization yeah. after the fact, which it thinks is a reason, that doesn't mean that it never has access to a reason if the information is, is available. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it normally it's doing its job. Yeah. Who, who uh, I put food outside of my cave last night. It's not there today. I wonder, let's, let me try to figure that out. Uh, you know, and, and, it, and the rational process works. So it, that's what makes us figuring out patterns is what we do all day long. And we can just trick the system. And then the system tricks us by, uh, like in the exa example I gave, uh, uh, a, a clinical example I gave of a panic attack. You're sitting there having a perfectly rational moment in a perfectly rational place in a restaurant, and all of a sudden we goose up your brain uh, through some collision of stimuli that we don't understand, and we get a sense of free-floating anxiety. And uh, we immediately hypothesize, I, do, I hate this feeling, I do not want this feeling again. Said, it must be that restaurant, it must be that, or who I was with, and, and the phobias start. We immediately th theorize. So that's where we've tricked it to, to not be, be playing to our better uh, 
use, but, sure. but yeah. normally it does. I'd say that's, it's the, I, I think that's its fundamental purpose. In the case of the supposed illusion of conscious choice, though, I mean, is this a special category? Is that always an illusion? And is it the, the fact that um, you've got this post hoc character of the, either the pinpointing of the moment of decision or the reporting of the moment of decision that gives us that illusory character? Because if that is what um, establishes the nature of the illusion, then there are possible answers. I mean, you could simply say that what you're measuring is just reaction time, or you could come back with a response that makes the event bigger than you're saying it is. For example, I'm thinking of the, the things where someone is told that at some time in the next 10 minutes, they're going to have to press a button. Um, and then, you know, at some time they do decide to press the button, you've got the 500 millisecond delay and all the rest of it. But they have already, in some sense, decided to press the button mm -hmm. at the point at which they, they uh, agreed to take part in the experiment. Right. And decisions are maybe just bigger than a single point in time. Yeah. Well, uh, one tries to bring these under uh, experimental control in the kind of experiments I'm talking to you and, and the, uh, I'm going to press the button tomorrow at noon. Or it's, it's not one of them. <laughs> but but uh, uh, no. I, I mean, here, here, here's, a, here's a fundamental fact. I don't think any of us can get out, get away from the fundamental fact that by the time you're consciously aware of something, your brain's already done it. How, how else can it be? And because of that, I mean, that's just a, like kind of physics one, okay? Now, phenomenally, we just don't think we're just sitting watching life, right? We think we are moving it around. We are part of it. So that's psychological fact one. So how do you put these two things together? Well, uh, do we, have we evolved to back refer things in time? So that, so I, I'm just suggesting that as, as something that, and in fact there's experimental evidence of that kind of thing from Lao. But uh, that, that, that's the idea, I'm, I'm suggesting that's what's evolved to make us feel uh, that we're in charge, I don't know. I mean. Both facts are true. Interpretation is what I'm, I'm offering. I mean, both statements, I feel, are, are factual and true. Uh, a little package like this here. Um, one just behind and then one at the back there. Actually, the other will be... Oh, sorry. Who's it? Sorry. Ah. Yes. Um, I, I guess when you're trying to distinguish two theories, you want to get them in the position where they're making different predictions. And I was wondering, in the case of, of where the person has the same electrode go off in their brain and on the one hand thinks it's a rose and the other an egg, mm -hmm. would, would our theory, so I'm a harsh reductionist thinking the brain is doing this, I'd predict that a bunch of cells in the brain are in a bad mood and will interpret things badly. And so I'd predict that they'll, they'll do those behaviours. And then the, the uh, person who took Cart Descartes seriously would make the prediction that my mental state will come down and affect my interpretation. So, so we're not making different predictions. How do you how do you get the two theories to predict different things? Yeah. Uh, if there was uh, uh, the, the the notion, I guess I was trying to get at there is that, and it's probably not even true, uh, in the sense that the the simulation of the electrode in those two conditions probably finds the brain in a totally different state, actually, because of this, if the, uh, if the gastric system of the lobster has 200,000 possibilities in any second of firing to produce something, and, and you look at the, our complexity, that, those two states are not going to be the same. But, so just imagining it's the case in, in state one versus state, uh, state two, um, I would think the, um, the upwardly causal person would not predict that, would not predict that that same simulation state would produce a different phenotypic response. That can only be explained by there being another process in there intervening that comes still from the determined system. That, maybe, that, maybe that example doesn't work for you, but that, that's what I was trying to get at. Hello. Uh, you asked, you made the very interesting point that um, t 
to ask a question to study X, Y, or Z might depend where you put the electrode. Um, that made me think, uh, suppose you wanted to make an intervention, you could ask the same question, where do you make the intervention if you want to change a mental state? I'm thinking of mental illness and uh, the, the search for what the popular press calls the gene for schizophrenia or um, continued pharmaceutical interventions to um, treat certain forms of mental illness. So the question is, do you think this kind of, of uh, view of emergent mental states makes a difference to where you would make an intervention if you wanted to change something no. in the psychosocial world of yeah. individuals? That's a great question. Um, the, um, I mean, we do know now that there are, in deep brain stimulation work, there's a whole uh, rash of new studies that suggest that various sites of clinical depression can be found and alleviated with stimulation, but that's different from the question you're asking. That's where they're just saying, if there's a combinational manipulation of mental state with this, you might achieve some greater efficiency. I, I don't know. Uh, but it, it, would, it would seem to, it would, it's, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. One more question on the right, right there. Hi, um, I'm asking the same question I asked in uh, the last lecture, uh, which is that taking the example of the ants that you showed earlier, would you say the group of ants working together to construct the ant hill, having a collective intelligence or a collective consciousness or a collective personhood right. is the same as one ant and all its brain systems, discrete brain systems working separately or together to have one consciousness? No. Why, what's the difference? I, I, I just, I, I mean, that's like wondering whether the, the group of, of 13 billion neurons in my head that all play an active role in making me have a conscious moment are all in and of themselves conscious of what they're doing. I think that's patently wrong. So, so you're saying the group of neurons coming together have one kind of consciousness, but the group of ants no, coming no, together... No, I, I, don't think that, I don't think they are conscious. I don't think that's where you, f you look for the solution to find out, finding the physical, physical instantiation of the conscious phenomenon is in a neuron or two neurons. It's in some neuronal mechanism that enables the phenomenal consciousness, but you wouldn't say the elements that enable it are conscious of the fact that they're doing that. That's, that's just simple. Thank you. Um, I'm an amateur at this field, so you'll be patient with my question, please. But um, come back to your uh, analogy or your, your discussion of moving from quantum mechanics at the subatomic level up to the molecular level. Um, it would be, am I right? It would be impossible to predict uh, the physics, the laws of physics that operate at a molecular, supramolecular level on the basis of the physics that operate at a subatomic level. That is to say, it, it's almost as if when you move upward in a certain way, uh, a different set of, yeah. a different set of behaviors that, that, uh, right. obtain. That's, that's Laughlin's point. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. are you, it still struck me that you were attempting to move upward from neuron behavior to social behavior or to, uh, to mental mental states. Obviously, there's no other basis for it in the same way that there's no other basis for molecular forms than subatomic forms, but can the behavior at one level adequately account for what we see at another level? Yeah, that, I mean, uh, you, you've restated the, the question is how, how do you represent in neurologic terms what is the right level of description to capture what goes on in the brain that underlies cognitive states? And uh, there's an army of neuroscientists 
working hard to look at it at every level. But what is not commonly done is to build the relationship between those levels and to see uh, where you actually should be fixated, where you should actually look for the explanation that explains the higher level. That's, uh, for all the young students uh, here, that's uh, the $64 question of the next 200 years. Uh, we, we have glimpses of insight into this. That's all we have, little glimpses. Uh, we have fantastic knowledge about cellular, cellular interactions and all that. Fantastic knowledge, I mean, don't misunderstand me. It's when you, when you try to go for the whole nut you realize how limited your knowledge is. When you're going, when you're, stu when you're studying ocular motor control mechanisms, when you're studying brain mechanisms involved in spatial location, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge about all that stuff. But when you really try to take it to the other level of how you actually should limit your description at the brain level to explain at a higher level, that, that is, a, there's lots of room for discussion and debate and hard work. <laughs> this production is copyright the university of edinburgh